This podcast is brought to you by sarahraven.com, which is home to everything you need for a truly beautiful and productive garden. You'll also find great and essential gardening kit and stylish, lovely things to have in your house to bring the outside indoors, all inspired by the garden and the house being tied together. There's also plenty of garden inspiration, how-to videos and specialist growing guides. So head over to sarahraven.com today to discover even more. Welcome to Grow, Cook, Eat, Arrange, the podcast of me, Sarah Raven, and yay, we've got Arthur back this week. How lovely is that? Arthur Parkinson is joining me. He's been busy writing and drawing and illustrating his lovely new books, which we're going to do a whole episode on them a little bit later in the summer. But Arthur, hello, it's lovely to have you back. Hello. I know it's so long and I've, I've not actually seen you physically. So this is lovely. I know they can't see but we can see each other. So it's nice. <laughs> exactly. It's really, really nice. And just tell us a little bit about what you've been up to. Um, a lot of time on trains going from various places. Launching your book. Yeah. Yeah, can't, yeah. Well, like you with your your wonderful veggie book, really. Yeah, and it, it goes on and on, doesn't it? A little bit, and yeah. you know, you look at the diary and think, oh God, no, I'm not, I'm not off next week because I've got to be at the end of the country. Yeah, but it's been amazing and meeting so many people at, at all the talks who love love the podcast. So it's been lovely. Yeah. Oh, good. So what Arthur and I thought we would have a catch up about today is kind of the new things that we've learned in the garden this year. And just so keep it really general and just the things that have come sort of uppermost in our mind and just chat for about half an hour about those things. So, I mean, it was your idea, Arthur. Why don't you kick us off? Well, I think with with all this traveling, it's it's really funny, isn't it? When I when I first started gardening, all I would think about was one single flower. Mm. And quite often when I would arrange, actually, I just wanted that big, abundant bunch of one thing or a mixture of the same things of different varieties. Whereas now, bizarrely, I really want to feel like I'm in a potager or in a wildflower meadow where I'm picking one of one thing and three of another thing and it just becomes this marzipani mm. jumble more and more, which mm. is very bizarre because I never thought I'd want that. But actually, largely due to stress, to be honest, and, and mental health, I am suddenly needing to step into the garden and needing it to nurture me mm. rather than needing to nurture the garden for literally four hours, you know. Yeah. So I honestly don't think I will ever want a garden again where I've got 15 dolly tubs all full of dahlias when right. I get back after a weekend away or say I've been away working. I don't want the stress or the feeling of almost like having a baby that's crying. I want to yes. walk into the garden and feel like I've got a day well-behaved, happy baby, <laughs> yes. if that makes any sense. <laughs> it really does, it does. So you're saying ornamental low maintenance is kind of what you're hinting at. Yeah, still still gorgeous. I mean, I went mm. to, um, I was in Derbyshire last week, and as usual, like, you know, I get to Chatsworth, which is like my Shangri-La, but mm. then we went to Haddon Hall, which is down mm. the road. Oh, amazing. Which in many ways is a total contrast because... That I don't think they have many gardeners at all. They're very mm. honest about that, so I, I can say that. But mm. the whole garden feels different, and it's just as romantic, but it's more got its own almost like ecosystem going on because you can just see it's much more constant. So you mm. walk out into like a herb parterre, mm. and there's loads of bearded iris and lavender and so many bees and things have self-seeded, and that's mm. a little bit more towards the the kind of garden that I want to feel I'm I'm creating. I mean, mm. it's a contradiction because literally I have just ordered, because I didn't grow on one as a tuber, your daughter's coming in the post, Rosie Raven, the dahlia. Oh, uh, yeah. I did grow <laughs> Molly from a tuber. Um, so I do I do always want a few dahlias and a few glamour pots. Mm. But amongst all that, I want the rest of the garden to really feel like it's its own culture and rhythm and that I'm just going in and helping a little bit. So perennials and shrubs, basically, and roses, yeah. of course. Yeah, L yeah, definitely roses. Which mm. I think you you would be in agreement. You know, I would. Five years ago, mm. I think for you before Josie came along to Perch Hill, mm. they you didn't have tons of roses at Perch Hill, did you? Whereas now you've got a real collection, and 
you've got all the annual glamour, but those roses give the whole garden, right from when the tulips start, they give a, a skeleton, don't they, of the, the foliage and then you get the flowers. No, 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 I, I, I completely agree. But I mean, actually, on my list of things that I wanted to chat about when I was making notes uh, last night after you suggested this, I, I definitely had on my list just, I wanted to mention a couple of roses that I've just discovered this year. Um, mm. that I've just blown away by, as well as a couple that I've grown for a while. And I know this year particularly has been good for roses, hasn't it? Because I think the very, very wet spring and the very cold winter, they've they've thrived. So they're all healthy, but also their flowers are massive. Mm. So I would love to mention Timeless Purple, which I think is a relatively newly bred variety. And it's a funny one because it opens sort of purple and then and then turns quite an intense pinky color. And the scent is unbelievable. It's absolutely incredible. It lasts well in the vase. It looks great. Flowers for ages, really healthy, really quite, you know, vigorous. So you can pick it quite heavily. I, I just love it. And then a completely new one to me this year, which has really come into its own. We planted it last, no, autumn 2021 and it's now looking incredible so you know i mean only a few months later and it's james mason and it's it looks like a sort of gallica rose so it's got that absolute velvet glamour really deep crimson red and then this beautiful gold anthers in contrast at the center of the flower again really healthy pretty vigorous really wonderful perfume and then I just would have to mention too that we've grown here for years, but I've been blown away by this year because of their unbelievable glamour, which is Just Joey and Belle Epoque. Mm. And Just Joey is a sort of, uh, well, it's the sort of colour that you love, which is that sort of coral, sort of soft. Custody, isn't yeah. it? But it's not as not as intense. No, it's wonderful. It's I love it. It's sort of more muted, yeah, apricotty. Mm. And then um, Belle Epoque, like the tulip, but not La Belle Epoque, but just Belle Epoque. I mean, is amazing. It's actually outside the staff room door here. And it's a sort of soft, uh, kind of corally yellow color on the inside, and then a sort of plum um, on the reverse. And it, it's amazing. Whenever I walk past, I have to put my nose in it because it just smells totally, totally extraordinary. So I agree. I mean, I think definitely perennials, roses and shrubs are something that we're going to concentrate more and more on here. Although I have to say also on my list, and then I'm going to come back to you, is I spent a whole weekend gardening, which was such a, a privilege for me because I'm often so busy that I don't get out to the garden as much as I'd like. But I actually was in the annual cutting garden and I'm doing this course like you have with the online course filmmakers called Create Academy. And I've got a cutting patch, which is 20 foot by 20 foot, and I know I should do that in meters, really. But I spent the weekend gardening that. And I had such a lovely time making sort of frames to support the Sorinthi and putting in kind of architecture and, and weeding and hoeing and mulching and staking and just pottering in the beautiful mm. weather. And I just had the best time. So I do like a little bit of high maintenance as well as low maintenance. But you do have to have time. You're right. Yeah, I I totally, totally agree. And I mean, I literally was rushing to leave yesterday morning and I knew I'd got a tray of Cosmos apricotta that were desperate mm. to be pricked out. Mm. Literally, I had 10 minutes. Um, I was still half dressed and, you know, I had a cup of a cup of tea hanging mm. off my shoulder. Yeah. And I had to get these these poor seedlings into their little nine centimetre pots. And I, I, I love doing a bit of it. You're, you're completely right. There is something very invigorating about having dominance over that that packet of seed and um the cosmos apricotta you introduced me to i mm. remember it so beautiful and that lovely smoky pink uh very yeah. different to any of the cosmos anyway i'm going to combine it in a very large pot with um my traditional favorite cosmos rebenza yeah because i think those two colors together and the airiness of those two i can just imagine them dancing in, yeah. in that autumn light so yeah as, as we're saying we we're trying to get a bit of both worlds of the old you know cottage garden style with the the high maintenance glamour that you can cut from for the vase yeah exactly so that mm. it, with cut and come again things you can embellish inside as well as have it outside no yeah i completely agree so my next thing that i've been 
Oh, so joyful for me this year is yellow rattle. Oh. So we've got really coarse grass down the drive here that actually when we I first found this house 30 years ago, they were cutting the grass with a scythe and raking it. And it was almost one of the things that sold me this place. That it was so romantic. But it is, it's very fertile, the soil here. So the grasses are very strong. And I've battled trying to get wildflowers going down the drive here. And we've tried sowing yellow rattle several years running. But finally, it seems to have really taken hold. And there are really big patches, you know, almost the size of an elephant size patches all the way down the drive. And it's so amazing that where it is, the grass is so suppressed because, of course, it's parasitical on the grass roots, a yellow rattle. And where it isn't, unfortunately, it hasn't yet spread to. It's just, you know, it's standing up already to mid-thigh height, the grasses. And so you can just see the impact of the yellow rattle so strongly. And then what follows after the yellow rattle is, of course, that you've impoverished the grasses so then wildflowers can get either introduced as plugs or can just start spreading themselves if you've got a nice good seed bank underneath the grasses. But on clay soil, it's very difficult to have interesting wildflowers, unlike on chalk. But I feel that the yellow rattle has now got me one step nearer 30 years on. Do you think that's the coldness of the winter that's made it so much more vigorous? Oh, that activated it. That's maybe. a really that's a really good point because they need you need to sow it in the autumn, don't you? In yeah, August, September, October, and then you need the cold to to spark germination. Mm. Yeah, I think you might be right. That really cold week that we had, or ten days yeah. at the end of November, wasn't it? May well mm. have helped. Yeah, it's just ah, oh, it's been joyful. Anyway, what's yours? Well, it's it's interesting because you. I know you didn't go to Chelsea because otherwise I would have, of course, seen you. Mm. But what what was really interesting about this year's Chelsea? What I noticed more than ever is people really seem to be attracted to flower filled gardens, mm. but they're getting a bit confused with the wilding gardens. Oh, yes. And um, there didn't seem to be this year one that married the two together, particularly. Uh, with the nail on the head, I think people were drawn to one garden in particular, which was the Sarah Price garden, mm. which I'm sure you saw, which was full of those incredible Benton bearded yeah. irises. And I think the reason it, it won people's hearts so much was because the flowers were really up against the, the pathway. Mm. So it was immediate uh, people to flower contact, like marriage, oh, rather than having, yeah. you know, so much bramble and, and greenness that unless you were in the garden, you didn't really realise what was going on, even if it was beautiful in the garden. Oh, that's really so interesting. So what, what I love to do when I've been to Chelsea is I go on the websites, including yours, and I see which which plants are suddenly out of stock. And of course, almost everywhere is mm -mm. has got no bed because mm -mm. um, we all fall in love with them. And thinking about climate change and, you know, hot pots, I've actually fallen for irises. So I've got some coming soon. For, which will flower hopefully next year. Mm. I mean, it's it is suddenly a luxury, and they may well turn to, out to be pots that I just find very boring because I know they're only going to give me flowers for a couple of weeks. Yeah, but I go. just think there's nothing there's nothing more English and, and beautiful, but at the same time, Mediterranean, deserty, islandy than a, a bearded iris. And I know you've got a, a very hot wall, haven't you? And yeah. I think they've been in there now for is it about since three lockdown. years? They've been in, yeah, yeah, since March 2020. Yeah. Mm. I yeah. got them just before we all went into lockdown, so I planted them. No, I completely agree. And the thing is about that wall, it's a desert. And so I have, first of all, bearded iris to flower from the middle of May till the middle of June. And then there's a lull. And then I've got noreens that flower from the middle of September till the middle of November. And they both love being parched and not being moved and just mm. sort of getting on with it really and as long as I mulch with grit so that I don't want to mulch with organic matter because you don't want to enrich the soil too much but the weed oh. you know suppression is pretty effective and so it's a very low maintenance border but they really have had a, a massive renaissance haven't they the, the beard mm. eyes I mean yeah. of course they're good one of the reasons that they're so popular at Chelsea is that's exactly when they flower. They're in season, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but do you, do you find you have to divide those irises since you had them planted or have they just got on with it? They've got on with it since 2020, but this season, oh. once they have stopped flowering, we're going to do that now in the middle of right. summer. And that's when you do it. Funnily enough, you do it in August. And that's quite oh. a nice thing. It's quite a nice job to have when it's quite a quiet time, really, in the garden. Mm. So 
Yeah, that's one of the summer jobs that you can do. And you just lift the whole thing, get rid of the central section and take the sort of juicier outer bits of the clump of corms and then plant them very, very near the soil or on the soil surface. And to prevent wind rock, I quite often cut uh, the foliage back a bit, leaving a bit for photosynthesis, but to let them settle back in again. You mm. don't want them to, to rock in the wind if it's not sheltered where you are. So my my one kind of linked to the whole sort of climate change thing, I think, is we have found increasingly with heat that mildew uh, can become more of a problem in drought. And we, we did a, a trial this spring, actually, in the greenhouse with ranunculus, which famously get mildew on their foliage and start to look really manky and horrible. And so we started this treatment program with them where once every week to 10 days, with just a water atomizer, we did a mix of bicarbonate of soda in water with a teaspoon of washing up liquid and a teaspoon of sunflower oil. And the washing up liquid and the sunflower oil make it a slightly more sticky liquid. And so it sticks on the leaf. And we started doing that before there was any sign of mildew on the Renunx, and they remain pristine throughout their whole flowering cycle. So we're going to start rolling that out um, of anything wow. that we find. You know, like sweet peas and a dry yeah. season can get mildew. So we're going to try and roll it out over everything that has a tendency. Wow, evolutionary then for Renunculus, because I'd never grow them because I'd just be worried about the mildew. Exactly. Yeah. And they're such a wonderful family. And I've, I've been put off you know, growing various things like even um, Nicotiana sylvestris, only the mm. lonely, because I found that got mildew and then often got something else. But I think if it works against mildew, it'll probably work against un other funguses. So, yeah. um, And it's such a simple organic treatment that it's a homemade treatment and non-chemical. I mean, obviously mm. it's a solution, but it, it's something it's you use in the kitchen. It's not going to hurt any insects, is it? No, no, exactly. So I'm excited by that. Genius. What's your next one? Well, I've got a pot by a shady door, and it's a fern actually that you sent me last year. And mm. in its its second year, it's looking so beautiful. It's not in a particularly big pot. It's like a little lovely, just like urny shaped pot. And it's that lovely silver fern, the metallicum one. Oh yes. And it's so lovely in the the evening light and in the morning light. And it just, I don't think I've even watered it for about two weeks, even though it's been hot. Wow. Or well, certainly not, you know, watered it properly. And, you know, again, I, I never thought I'd be bothered about ferns. But actually, for just something that, you know, you literally open the door and go, oh, you're looking happy. That's nice yes. to see. It's a joy. And um, unlike the bloody hostas next door, which which actually have done well, mainly because it's been dry, so slugs haven't got on them, a fern, nothing seems to attack a fern, does it? No. And they just, they just get on with it. So I'm very grateful for that. And it's such a beautiful, almost like the kind of William Morris wallpaper ferny leaf that you want. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd really recommend that to anyone who, you know, just wants something beautiful in, in a shady place. And do you know what? I've started taking shade much more seriously and enjoying mm. shade. And I'm sure that's because of the drought last summer yeah. and then the drought early this summer. And actually, of course, the things in the shade are much less stressed because they're not mm. as hot as being out there in the baking heat. So I've just planted um, late this spring, I planted a, a sort of big water trough of just such a simple mix of Pelagonium tormentosum, which I know shrives, uh, shrives, thrives in shade. Shrives is quite good for thriving in shade. But anyway, I've mixed that with Nicotiana sylvestris. And then I've actually mm. put some cosmos in it because it does get some light and the cosmos may struggle a bit, but it's out on the edge of the lawn. So it's, it's shaded for, I don't know, maybe... It gets light maybe from just 12 till 4 or something. So I'm hoping the cosmos will get enough light. Anyway, I'm excited about that. But I, I, shade gardening is something that I'm getting more and more interested in. And I do think with climate change, we all are actually. And so those of us who've cursed having a shady garden, I think you, you might be quite grateful for it as, as climate change continues. Yeah, definitely. All those sunken London basement gardens. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I th I'm sure that'll probably add property value, won't it? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're like oasis aren't they? They're... They will be, won't they? You'll be queuing up to rent one for the weekend. Yeah, and get rid of the <laughs> car park where, the, you know, where you park the car over your concrete and put it into a lovely shady yard. I think they're going to be, they're going to be very valuable. Um, so my my second but but last of the things that I I jotted down 
was the importance of minarets. And I have banged on about this quite a bit because Vita Sapphire West had this wonderful phrase that if you've got undulating roses or anything of a roundy shape, sort of dome shape, you must, mustn't forget the minarets at the corners or not necessarily at the corners, but the balance in a design between verticality and horizontality. And when I got up really early this morning, it was slightly misty actually this morning, but there was this beautiful sort of shafts of light coming through. And it just struck me that the minarets were looking absolutely splendid. And it was three in a row. And the first was foxgloves, which of course you sew, you need to sew kind of by the middle of summer, ideally, but certainly by late summer. And it was the white one. And next to it was one of the linearias. And I think it's just the, the wild one, but also next to it was Linaria Canon Went. And that was sort of a more airy minaret. But the thing that really blew me away was Allium Summer Drummer. And they're already standing at about 10 foot tall here. But each bulb that I planted two autumns ago, so autumn 2021, have now clumped up. And I've got maybe seven minarets per bulb. And they're scattered all through the Oast Garden in, in sort of, you know, not dense drifts at all, but they're absolutely spectacular backlit. And even though the flowers haven't opened yet, just the scale of these crazy minarets. So mm. I'm just wild about that. I'm going to put lots more of that in the Oast Garden this autumn. It, it's just really in the farmhouse garden. It's really made it this year for me. Mm. Well, I'm going to continue and end with with my list with your your biennial mention of, of foxgloves. But the the biennial that I've loved this summer, which mm. has been this spring, sorry, which has been worth its weight in gold, has had to be the honesty mm. because it's without that the garden for a few weeks, you know, after the tulips would have felt quite quite in between. But thanks to just having, I think I planted eight plants last autumn. Mm. They arrived from you, but this year I'm going to do try and remember to do some seed sowing of it. Sowing. Yeah. Because they, they really did make the garden carry it on into into early summer. And the nicest thing about them was the butterflies. Mm. They they did come to the garden and I've not seen many butterflies this year, but they, they did visit the honesty. So I think it's a top, you know, butterfly attracting early spring flower to have. Great. And it's a lovely seed. I, I like seeds that I can see and count. Yeah. So you can space it out nicely in a seed tray. Yeah. It doesn't mind being pricked out. And if it does like your garden and you manage to rip up the soil in time, it will self-seed. Yeah. And that lovely dark purple one called Cheglo, is it? Is yeah, that the one? it is. When it when it goes to seed pod, it's actually almost like a crimson amber when the sunshine hits it. Yeah. And yesterday it's in my, my grandma's front garden, which is very, very dry in full sun. And coming into flower is the the Alstroemeria Indian Summer. And that, mm. against the Honesty Seed Pod, was honestly like a, a stained glass window in Notre Dame. Mm. Um, and it was the most gorgeous, by chance, combination. Because I, you know, I planted those Honesty and I think the Alstroemeria's, you know, they'd long long since been picked or cut down for, for autumn. Mm. So it's it's just lovely when that happens, isn't it? When you, when two plants marry, by chance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fabulous. I love the sound of that. So my final one that I'm going to try and do more of this autumn is clematis through shrubs. So just mm. like you, I'm really, I regret not planting more shrubs in the garden here. When I started, I was so keen on my annuals and dahlias yeah. that I really haven't put enough shrubs in. So I'm definitely going for them. But to extend their their season of interest. It's a real cliche. I mean, it's like people have been doing it forever. My parents did it, but growing a climber through the shrub that flowers at a different time to the shrub is such a, a simple win. And so mm -hmm. I've been trialing lots of different clematis to then put through our shrubs here. And we've had a really successful combination of the black leaf Sambucus, the black elder with Prince Charles growing through it. But I've just discovered this new series of clematis called the Boulevard series, which are bred for containers. So they're really quite compact and not too vigorous, but I find them vigorous enough to grow through a smaller shrub, not a whopper, but a smaller shrub. And so I'm going to have things like the Boulevard series growing through my rosemaries, through my tucreums, that kind of thing. And they've got these, I mean, there's one called Nubia that's flowering at the moment that is literally like it's cut from sort of port wine velvet. It's absolutely stunning. Cuts really well. I find if I sear the stem ends in boiling water, I've been picking it heartily right the way through the summer. 
And so I'm going to try more and more of these Boulevard series varieties. And sometimes when I read something's been bred for containers, I think, oh, you know, is it going to be a bit fussy because it's smaller? But this, it couldn't be less fussy. It's absolutely stunning. So that would be my final is, is going back to the traditional thing. I think Penny Hobhouse used to write about it and Rosemary Vary, but planting a climber to grow through a shrub is an absolute winner. Yeah. I could see why we both didn't do that in the beginning, though, because it's harder to pick, isn't it, out a shrub? Yeah, it is. But it's, it's nice yeah. to have choices, isn't it, even so? Yeah, and it's very low maintenance. It just comes up year after year after year. So, yeah. And, you know, depending on the clematis pruning time, they're, they're pretty easy to look after, aren't they? Yeah, keep your labels. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, keep your labels. Oh, thank you, Arthur. It's lovely yeah, to have you back. It's been lovely. It's and, been like um, being back at Perch Hill with you through the garden. And I think <laughs> um, our ne- our, it, in a month or two's time, I think you're doing another one and then another one. So he's yeah. back regularly, <laughs> if not every episode. So <laughs> thank you for rejoining us all. And it's lovely to chat. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to me and Arthur on Grow Coquita Range. Lovely to have Arthur back. And next week, I'm joined by another wonderful young person. I love having wonderful young people on the podcast. And it's Alice Vincent joining me next week. And we're going to talk about her book, Why Women Grow. You can find more information, photos and advice sheets on all the plants and recipes we talk about on this podcast by heading to the show notes or at sarahraven.com forward slash podcast.